our world, home to all the people we will ever meet and all the things we will ever love. Humans have developed the ability to use our resources in order to make our lives easier. In other words, to have a better lifestyle. However, as you might all know, there is a price to pay for convenience. You see, the fact that when you feel thirsty or hungry, you can just walk five minutes to a convenience store and buy anything you want, or when you run out of toilet paper or need to change the light bulb, you can just easily find it anywhere. You can, for example, the convenience is so amazing that you can even buy underwear at convenience stores. So for, for all of this, the price we have to pay is the price we have to pay for industry. Now, as we need more things, as our lifestyle improves, we have a bigger demand for things. So industry grows, and industry keeps growing to unsustainable levels until it starts damaging the environment. Luckily, we're trying to change this, and you have science finding new energy sources, or, for example, people working on better technologies, greener technologies, and people, for example, changing from cars to public transportation or using less water when they take showers in order to save resources. Now, this, causes a, this, is a, this has a good effect on, on our environment if we all do it. But there is also another kind of industry that I want to talk about today, which we usually ignore. Maybe because it's a very basic need or because it's, something, it's, it's a very important part of our culture. And that is the food industry. So now that I mentioned sustainability, efficiency, food and industry, let me get straight to the point. Our current food industry is extremely unsustainable. Food industry, in particular, animal production, is one of the, one of the most inefficient and wasteful methods we could have ever come up with to produce food. Now, to explain why this is true, let me introduce you to my friend Mu. Mu is a cow who is going to live for five years and then it's going to be killed for its meat. Now, during these five years, Mu needs a lot of food. The amount of food that Mu needs is so amazing that more than 50% of our agriculture is being used to feed animals that we produce for food. Using only a fraction of this food, we could feed all the people in the world. Also, for this food, we need to use big amounts of water. Mu itself also drinks a lot of water. And if you consider all these little factors in, the, in, in these five years and all the meat production process, the amount of water you need to produce one kilogram of beef is so amazing that the graph is extremely surprising. If you compare grains and other plants to meat production, you would have that you usually need around 100 times the same amount of water to produce one kilogram of beef. Now, for one kilogram of beef, this amount of water is almost the same amount of water you would use if you took a shower every day for two years. And this is only one kilogram of meat. Now, Mu also needs land. Currently, we're using around 30% of our land, of Earth's land, for animal production. This is a problem when you consider places like the Amazon, in which 70% of the area that used to be forests is now being used for animal production, so we cannot plant trees there anymore. Mu also produces a lot of waste. In big farms with thousands of animals, the amount of excrement produced by animals is so big that you cannot just use it as a fertilizer, but it mostly gets thrown into rivers. As an example of how this pollutes our environment, most of the sulfur and nitrogen pollution in the South China Sea is due to animal production. And finally, we have greenhouse gases. Mu, of course, produces CO2 when it breathes, but it also produces methane, which is a more dangerous greenhouse gas than CO2. Now, if you compare animals with transportation, such as cars, trains, airplanes, who thinks that transportation creates more greenhouse gases than animals? Who thinks it's transportation more than animals? Surprisingly, 18% of our greenhouse gas emissions are due to 
annual production, compared to only 13% of it that comes from transportation. Other sources include natural gas extraction and other uh, fossil fuels. But as you can see from all this information that I gathered from some, some studies and from a report by the United Nations, I think it's pretty clear that our food industry, and in particular our animal production, is a big environmental issue and that we have to do something about it. Especially considering that in the next 50 years it is expect expected that our uh, meat consumption will double. Now, what can we do about this? Well, the obvious thing to do is to stop eating meat. But don't worry, I didn't come here today to tell you all to stop eating meat right now. <laughs> no, that's unrealistic, of course. No, no one, I cannot just tell 100 people to do that. But I want to show you some alternatives. And of, of course, right now you might be wondering, okay, who is this guy and why is he talking about our environment and about what we should eat? Is he an environmentalist or a nutritionist? The truth is I'm just a chemistry student at Nagoya University from a small country called El Salvador. And I came to Japan three years ago. And during these three years, I've met many people from different backgrounds. And for many reasons, one day I decided I would carry out the biggest experiment in my life. One day I said, okay, I would become vegan. I will give up any animal products from my diet. And I decided to write a blog about it and try to do so in six months. And I started this project exactly six months ago. And right now I'm mostly vegan. I cannot say completely because there are so many things in the market that you think they don't contain animal products, but they do sometimes. But I'm trying very hard not to consume any animal products. And rather than telling you why or how I did this, I want to t talk to you about my conclusions from this. So after reading a lot about environmental issues, about biochemistry, and about nutrition, I came up with the conclusion that we can, using our technology and our science, in particular, the chemistry of our food, it is possible to make a society in which we can produce our food in more efficient ways. Just in the same way, if I told you to go from Nagoya to Tokyo, you would think about using a Shinkansen or a bus, maybe, instead of a horse, for example. Or in the same way, you will trust your doctor with the medicines he will give you, instead of just drinking some magical potion. Why don't we use our science to produce our food in more efficient ways? So let me tell you, well, humans need um, seven basic nutrients. The first one is water, which is not included in this chart. Uh, the rest of the nutrients I've written, I've drawn this pie chart in which I've uh, put the proportions of them. Uh, these numbers are in grams that you need to consume every day. And you have fibers, carbohydrates, and fats, which are readily available in nature. You, you, we, you, we eat bread, pasta, rice, and many other uh, kinds of foods that contain most of these. If you eat seeds and nuts, you can easily get more, most of the oils you need. Then we have minerals, which even though um, you, can, you can get them almost everywhere, if you don't eat certain foods, you can still get them from inorganic sources and fortify your food with them. The problem comes with, when it, with proteins and, min and vitamins. Now, there are some vitamins that usually you can find only in animal products. Such an example is vitamin B12 and vitamin D3. Most of vegan or vegetarian people usually have problems because of their lack of these vitamins. But you see, these vitamins are molecules that are small enough for me to put them on the slide. They're not like big molecules like proteins or sugars. And it is actually possible to synthesize them from bacteria or to, through other so methods in order to add them into our foods. There, there are methods that had been used for more than 50 years to synthesize these molecules. But we don't do this. We don't just add this to our food because people eat meat. If we didn't eat meat, we could, for example, just fortify our foods with this in the same way people fortify their milk with calcium or their food with extra iron 
and we just put this in our food, and everything would be fine. Then we have proteins, which even though you can get many proteins from beans, soy, and many other kinds of products, the proportion of amino acids that you would get is not the same. And of course, like, it would be very hard for people just to change their diets into a bean diet. So this is when our biochemistry comes into play. And we have options such as, for example, this very recent cultured meat or in vitro meat, in which we can take stem cells from a cow and let them reproduce just in the same way it would do inside of a cow, but in a lab. And the amazing thing about this is the, this website of, by Maastricht, Maastricht University claims that using cells from one cow, you can get meat, the same amount of meat that you would usually get from 440,000 cows. If you think about how many animals you would have to raise for this, kind of, this amount of meat, and how you can make it so efficient using only some very simple, well, it's not that simple, but some kind of technology that we have nowadays, I think it's very obvious that we should st start doing more research on this kind of things. So this is just an example of how we can make new technologies to make our food industry more efficient. So why don't we, in the same way we make uh, more CO2 uh, efficient cars or some uh, cleaner energy sources, why don't we use our science to produce our food? Now, of course, this is not only about science, because besides the science part of it, if we keep eating meat, if we keep buying meat, these technologies cannot enter the market because the food industry is too powerful, economically speaking. So I would like to encourage you to do two things. First, if you're a scientist, think about this issue in the same way we think about making more efficient cars to make new technologies, to do research about it. Personally, I will try to become a biochemist and do research about it someday if I have the chance. Because I, th because I think it's very important. But also, even if you're not a scientist, you can help by reducing your meat consumption. Because if we don't do it, these technologies can never be sold at our nearest supermarket. Now, okay, I understand that when I tell people to reduce their meat consumption, I always get this kind of reactions, right? Man, meat is so good, I cannot quit it. It's impossible. I, what, else, what can I eat? I don't know what to eat instead. Well, first let me tell you, as from my experience, I've realized that there is a whole new world of foods that we ignore when we are just so too focused on meat. We think that meat is that delicious part of our meal. But that's not really true. There are many other delicious foods. But also, you don't need to go extreme vegan like me. You can just reduce your meat consumption. There are some alternatives already, such as the Meat Free Monday, which is supported by Paul McCartney, in which, you know, if everybody stopped eating meat for one day a week, we would already have reduced our 15%, uh, 15 percent, uh, by 15 percent, the amount of meat we, we, we consume. There is also this alternative by Graham Hill, uh, which was the topic of a TED, TED talk uh, some years ago. And it's called the weekday vegetarian, which is an alternative in, in which, the, well, people who want to become vegetarian but find it too hard can just be vegetarian from Monday to Friday and eat meat on weekends. Even though um, we still eat meat, we, already, we can already reduce our meat consumption, and this can help the environment. So this is not only true for the meat industry, but for any kind of industry, our lifestyles are very important. Because what we buy, what we consume, drives what the industry produces. So I encourage you, I want to encourage you today, to think about all the little things you do every day, and think about these little things and the money you're spending on it, can be influencing our environment in ways that you maybe never thought about. From my perspective, I think if we all work together, science and people awareness can fix this problem. Together, I think we can start a food revolution. Thank you very much.